All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the ICTS monthly colloquium. Um, so I'd just like to uh, make a few pointers uh, with regards to asking questions. This is a hybrid talk, so if you do have questions in person, please wait for the microphone so that everybody else can hear the question. Um, our speaker has generously offered that uh, if you have questions during the talk, please uh, do ask them. You don't have to necessarily wait till the end. That applies to the participants online as well. Uh, either um, put your question in the chat box, we'll be monitoring it, uh, or uh, raise your hand on the uh, appropriate icon. Um, so our speaker for today is uh, Tejas Guru Murthy from Civil Engineering in the Inst Indian Institute of Science. Um, Tejas is uh, a professor of uh, civil engineering. He started out as a mechanical engineer, which I learned recently uh, uh, in his undergraduate degree. Uh, then he went on to get a PhD in applied mechanics uh, from Purdue. Um, after that, he spent three years in the Cavendish lab. Um, and since two, uh, 2011, he has been at the Indian Institute of Science. And he does a lot of interesting stuff, um, a lot of interesting experiments involving materials at different length scales. Uh, so I think this is going to be exciting for a lot of us, um, even those of us who are interested in theory. There's a lot of interesting ideas that he will be talking about. Uh, his talk is uh, about understanding cohesive granular materials at multiple length scales. So with that, I'll hand it over to Tejas. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll give you, a, give you a very quick introduction to what is a granular medium. And then I'll talk about what happens if you have a small amount of cohesion in between particles in a granular ensemble. I'll talk about two length scales, experiments performed at the continuum or ensemble length scale, and then experiments performed at micro length scale. So I guess most of you know what are granular media. They, these are a collection of discrete macro, macroscopic particles. So any food grains, anything in the pharmaceutical sector, pills, tablets, et cetera, asteroids, uh, everything in the infrastructure and mining sector, all these are granular media. So uh, the examples are so many. But the interesting thing about this is that the mechanical behavior is governed by nonlinear interparticle interactions and rather than thermal fluctuations. So, uh, and they, there is a sort of a lack of a scale separation, but it poses some very interesting challenges for people working in. So, obviously, you can imagine why physicists as well as engineers would both be interested in granular media. Um, so, uh, let me show this uh, standard picture that you will see in many granular mechanics textbooks. We are talking about interparticle interactions, one at the grain scale, and then they kind of uh, show up at the meso scale where, uh, where these interparticle interactions you can see in some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of features. And I would call this at the representative volume element. And then, of course, at the macro scale, you'll see all these flows, uh, avalanches, and pretty much anything that you that you want to observe at the macro scale. And of course, engineering is performed at this particular length scale, uh, at the macro scale. And of course, physicists would possibly be interested in the in the interparticle interactions. So let's see how we could bridge this and traverse from the micro scale to the macro scale. And uh, so I, I will not go on to introduce continuum mechanics uh, theories, certainly, but I will say that uh, perhaps plasticity theory and some amount of kinetic theory are best used for studying granular media. Okay, so with that caveat, I'll just go ahead and introduce the experiments that I perform. And then at the end of my talk, I'll show you two or three instances of where these granular materials play a interesting role and why I have been interested in them for a long time now. Um, again, so at the continuum length scale, that is at an ensemble length behavior, one would want to ask, what is this, what represents a continua? In other words, how many particles should I actually consider, individual particles should I actually consider before I can call something a continuum, right? So that's a question that we would all like to 
ask because as I mentioned earlier, engineering is worked on at that particular length scale. So if I want to perform, let's say experiments in the lab, how big should my sample be? And how many grains should I have? Or how many particles should I have in that particular sample before I could actually call it a continuum and start using theories of elasticity, plasticity, and things like that, right? So that's a question that we'd like to answer. And by and large, the consensus is if you want to think about or think about applying ideas such as an ensemble stress or a representative volume, the idea is you should have at least the size of the specimen should be about 10 times the maximum particle size of the granular material. So this somewhat constitutes a continuum landscape. What I mean by that is if let's say you have about uh, the, the, the system size, that is the specimen size that you're working with in the lab has about 10 particles in the diameter and you know sufficiently large in the other dimension also, then you can think about this as representative, representing a reasonably large ensemble, okay? So uh, at some point, I'll also introduce that what happens when you have cohesion into this mix. So uh, the question is at this length scale for granular materials, very much is known, a lot is known. People have worked on it using kinetic theories when they're looking at uh, rapid flows, when they're looking at very, very slow flows, they use plasticity theory. So as I said, we are, we are good when we, when we have to think about at, at this field scale or the engineering scale. And of course, at the contact scale, uh, I think most of you have heard of uh, discrete element techniques or molecular dynamics essentially, where you think about each grain as as a rigid particle and you have contact laws and essentially solve a bunch of, uh, I mean, for all the particles, you solve Newton's laws across the ensemble and then you pretty much get velocities and forces and contact forces, et cetera, for the entire ensemble. So even at the micro scale, you, we can deal with things. But uh, what, what seems to be very interesting here is uh, what happens when you have cohesion between particles, right? That's, that's a question that, uh, one needs to uh, answer. And, and there are lots of instances where you do see cohesion between particles. Um, let me show you what that looks like. So if let's say you take a straightforward scanning electron micrograph of a sand specimen, this is what sand particles look like under the ACM, okay? And now you add some, oops, sorry is through here, one second. Okay, so these are particles of sand covered with some epoxy. Okay, so th these are the epoxy bridges that you see between the sand particles. And uh, so if you observe them in a microscope, these are glass beads, glass bellotini. This is a very standard granular medium that everybody uses. So if you have small amounts of cohesion between the particles, this is what it looks like under an SEM. Okay, a typical cohesive granular system. And this is what I study, okay? And uh, I mean, if you stick it under a tomograph, this is what a cross-section will look like. So these are, uh, I mean, there's some things that I want to highlight. These white color things that you see here are the cohesive bridges between the particles. So inter-particle interactions, as I mentioned to you earlier, are all frictional. So the, the question that I'm asking is what happens when you have small amounts of cohesion between them? What happens to the particle interactions and how do I model this? How do I study this? Okay. Now, uh, why do these uh, bonds exist or why does cohesion appear between particles? Because of so many geological reasons or uh, for that matter, if you just store powders over very long periods of time, just because of the fact that you have moisture and organic content, you have cohesion between particles. So that naturally emerges or uh, you know, leave uh, sand outside for a, a few months, you will see that it behaves like one big giant mass of a rock. So, uh, so it has implications in infrastructure, in uh, pharmaceutical industry, in the chemical engineering, food processing industry. So definitely it's a problem of interest for, uh, for me. Now, if I, now let me try to classify this based on how much cohesion exists between the particles. So I will call this as contact bound, void bound, and matrix bound. What I mean by that is, 
if I have cohesion only between particles, that is at the points of contact between two particles, I have cohesion between that, I mean, between the two particles, then I will call this as a contact bond. That is at the point of contact, you have a small cohesive bridge. That is that cementation of cohesion sticks exactly at that particular location. Now, you could pour a bunch of grains in a bottle and in the void spaces, you could fill it up with cohesion and that, that is what is called as a void bound. Or you could have the, the extreme case where the particles are somewhat segregated in a matrix of cohesive material. Okay, this is also fairly commonly observed. For example, any uh, in the infrastructure industry, this is called as concrete. Right, so you have a matrix of cement with particles sort of strewn in between, and they're segregated in this in this matrix of uh, cementation and. Uh, the, again, all these are fairly commonly observed in the infrastructure mining and food processing industries. Okay, now to study something at the ensemble level, uh, perhaps most of you have heard of things like uh, using the extension test or compression test for studying things like steel. So you take a bar of steel, stick it in a tension machine and pull it apart in tension and uh, you, you can find the yield stress and you can find mechanical properties that are of relevance to engineers. Now, what, what we do here instead is we make a, a hollow cylinder of this type of a system of glass beads and epoxy, and then apply an internal and external pressure to this hollow cylinder and a torque and axial load. So when you have an internal pressure and external pressure, a torque as well as an axial load, what you can end up doing is you can solve a very straightforward thin cylinder problem in elasticity. And in effect, you can control all the three principal stresses okay, of the stress tensor. And so essentially you will have a six component stress tensor on that, in that wall. So by playing around with these components, you can control the exact magnitudes and the directions of the three principal stresses. So if you do that, you can essentially explore this particular principal stress space, okay? Rather than just doing a simple uniaxial test or a compression test where you can only find out one magnitude of, uh, I mean, one, one value of stress, you could perhaps map out this entire, uh, I mean, you could, you could explore this entire stress space by playing around with these components of the stress tensor. I mean, this is just a very simple application of the thin cylinder problem. Okay, now what I present here is, uh, if let's say you do these experiments, build a hollow cylinder of our specimen, and then play around with the components of the, uh, of that, uh, of the internal pressure, external pressure, torque, as well as the axial stress, what I can do is I can exactly map out in this principal stress space, what the yield surface is for these types of ensembles. So it's a, it's a clever uh, experiment to do because it allows you this ability to, to exactly map out this critical combination of principal stresses that will allow the material to yield. Okay, and, and I mean, it would be very straightforward for materials such as standard solids, such as copper and steel and things like that, because you can take hollow tubes and these are the experiments conducted by Tresca, I don't know if you've heard of Tresca yield criteria and stuff like that. If you've done any plasticity theory, you must have heard of Tresca, von Mises. These are all names of yield criteria. And that's exactly how uh, plastic yield criteria are identified for any standard solid. So for solids that are cohesive granular, you have to do the exact same experiment, but with a little bit of, a, I mean, a little bit of playing around because of the effect of I1. I1 is the trace of the stress tensor, by the way. So this is the hydrostatic axis. So as you move along the hydrostatic axis, what I want to point out here is the yield surface goes on increasing. What does that mean? Sort of physically what that means is as I'm applying more and more confinement to my system, right? my system gets stronger and stronger. Okay. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes physical sense. In other words, let's say you take a steel rod and try to plunge it into the ground the deeper and deeper you want to plunge into the ground, the harder and harder it gets, right? So, I mean, you must have seen this. 
uh, in fact, it's very hard to stick your hand into a potted plant also, because the, it's very easy to go through the first one centimeter. Beyond that, it's really tough to go because, because just the effect of confinement. So as we move along this stress axis, as we move along the hydrostatic axis, the yield surface goes on increasing in size. That's kind of what it means, okay? So I have mapped that out using these experiments on the hollow cylinder, and we are able to map out exactly this particular yield surface. Now, I'll explain to you what yield means here. I have pointed out two things. One is, when does the interparticle cohesion break down? So what happens as I'm applying this combination of pressures and torques that the inter particle cohesion or the cementation that I was showing you earlier, the SEM micrographs, first thing what happens is this, this cementation begins to break down, okay? And then what happens is the particles begin to interact frictionally like, like what would happen in a typical um, uh, sand, okay? Typical granular ensemble. Now, um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm showing you here in terms of straightforward experiments. These are all some uh, sort of, uh, don't worry about what this means, deviatoric stress versus deviatoric strain. These are all, we use these terms because uh, it's a standard continuum mechanics type of a thing. Okay, what I'm showing you here is, so you can try to look at the peak stress here. Okay, as I'm applying increased amount of confinement, the ensemble becomes stronger and stronger. As I told you, the more confinement that you apply, the higher pressure that you apply, the system becomes stronger. Uh, and uh, again, there are some caveats here. And th these are also things called as intermediate principal stress ratio. So what I mean to say here is, if you, if you remember that small piece of the hollow cylinder, and I was telling you that I'm able to control all the three principal stresses. Now I can play around with the magnitudes of the three principal stresses. So if they're equal, the, when the three principal stresses are equal, you're obviously at a hydrostatic condition. Uh, but if I play around in such a way that uh, one, you know, the, the ratio between sigma one, two, and three, as they change, as I move from a very compressive response to a tensile response, I see that the, system remains by and large isotropic up till the peak stress. After that, it begins to change response, okay? Again, this is not very, very important for you to, uh, for you to understand here, but I just want to uh, present it so that just there's some level of continuity. I mean, I'd be glad to explain this a little bit more if you want. Okay, so uh, let's, let's look at it in aggregate. Let's, uh, so if I have a, if I have a cemented sand, that is if I have cohesion between particles versus no cohesion between particles, if this were my uh, completely uncohered material, and this is my cohered material. So as I told you earlier, first you will start breaking down the cohesion and eventually you'll reach a response that looks similar to the original sand. So first you have, as you start loading any cohesive granular system, you begin to break the cohesion and what you end up getting is a very simple ensemble of pure grains, okay? And the same thing happens when you increase the degree of bonding, okay? So as you move from, uh, as you add more and more cohesion into the system, the same thing happens, but it will take you a lot more time to come back to the original parent granular ensemble. So the, the process is you have breakdown of cohesion and eventually you'll reach a typical granular ensemble. And it's very common to show both volumetric response, that is the volume change in the system, uh, as well as uh, the stress in the system in any granular ensemble, because as you realize, uh, any system that contains a bunch of particles or grains is a bunch of particles, sand particles, for example, is always subjected to volume change. What I mean by that is, if let's say you have a box of sand, right? You apply any stress on the system. Before you start breaking down the grains, the first thing that happens is to the sand particles rearrange themselves and pack themselves, right? So it's very common in any continuum mechanics to show stresses. This is the typical stress strain curve that you will show for any piece of copper, steel, anything. But for sand uh, or glass beads or anything, in addition to the stress strain curve, you also have to show how does the packing change? Okay, that's, that's standard uh, 
that's that's the norm when you show the response. So it it kind of makes a lot of sense for us to look at how does the strength change along with it, how does the volume of the system change? So the volume of the system, please remember, is the readjustment of the voids in the system. So there are gaps in between the sand grains or in between the particles, and those sort of vanish away and they kind of interlock and they densify and they, the volume of the system changes. Okay. Uh, so the the other thing that uh, that we have that's fairly commonly used is that this cohesion between the particles you can model it in one simple way you can think about that as an additional confinement okay what what do i mean by confinement again as i told you as you move along up along the hydrostatic axis your system becomes stronger and stronger right this is the same idea of plunging a pole into the ground okay so you could model this interparticle cohesion also as the same thing. You can think about it as an additional confinement to the system. Okay. So these are some of the things that we wanted to ask. What happens at the micro lens scale? So this is globally at the ensemble lens scale. This, these pictures emerge for, for us to study what happens when you add small amounts of cohesion between particles. But what happens at the micro scale? What do the interparticle interactions look like? We just we sort of conjecture that the interparticle uh, cementation breaks down, but does it really break down? So if it breaks down, are there preferential paths in which these things break down? Or is this is it universally breaking down everywhere? Uh, so these are some of the questions that we'd like to address in our uh, research work. Okay. Again, uh, I'll come back to this, but I just want to point out things like uh, if, if you were to do work on the system, that is, as you're applying stresses and do work on the system, this, uh, if you think about a purely frictional response, that is a system where there is no cohesion between the particles, the total plastic work is a combination of both the friction as well as the dilation in the system. However, when you have bonded frictional materials, it's a combination of the friction, the dilation, as well as the bond breakage in the system. So the total plastic work done obviously increases because you have this bond breakage that you add to the system. So you could, in uh, in theory, plot the exact dissipative stress ratio and then look at exactly where the bonds are breaking down. Okay, Compare that with, uh, with a system where there is no bond breakage taking place and identify things like the gross yield point and do, do all sorts of continuum mechanics uh, analysis here. Again, we can also do the same thing and look at what happens when you change the confining pressure. What happens to the overall dissipation, the plastic work dissipation, I mean, when you have increased confinement in the system. Okay, you could do all this. Could you explain what you mean by bond breakage? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So do you see this picture here? So as uh, I think if you recollect one of the figures that I showed you earlier, when I mean a, a typical cohesive granular system. I'm talking about a system in which the interparticle contacts are mediated by a small amount of cohesion, right? That was the SEM figure that I showed you. So when you load the system, right? When you apply any stress on the system, our conjecture is by looking at these graphs, our conjecture is this interparticle cohesion that exists first breaks down. And what you have is just the then the frictional interaction between particles. So we need to identify what is that stress state at which this interparticle cohesion breaks down, right? That is just when you have contact. Yeah. So what would uh, happen if you have like a cement? Ah, the uh, great question. The cement-like thing or the, the very typical what is called as a concrete, that is dominated by fracture mechanics. So when you have a system in which you have a matrix and particles sort of impregnated into this matrix, and when you begin to load the system, the, the well-accepted theory is that you begin to initiate a fracture and the fracture propagates from particle to particle, okay, from one interface to the other. So that is a slightly different system that would, that was typically how a rock behaves, for example, or a sheet of glass behaves, for example. So you have, a flaw, and then you have that fracture, that, that flaw propagating, I'm sorry, you have a bunch of flaws and you have a fracture propagating from flaw to flaw and eventually the glass 
completely shatters. That's the, it's the same idea as to how a piece of rock would break, a piece of glass would break, a piece of concrete would break. All of them break with the, I mean, within this whole fracture mechanics kind of a theory. Whereas here, I'm talking about small amounts of cohesion between the particles. So whenever you have the small amount of cohesion between the two particles, you first break down that cohesion and then the particles begin to interact and uh, frictionally. No, that, that's, the, that's the point, right? That's what we, we want to investigate. So when, when you look at the global scale, we can't really identify how does this cohesion break down, right? All we can identify are things like this. Um, sorry, let me just go to, yeah. We can identify things like this, okay? We can identify the overall amount of work that is required for us to break down the cohesion and then compare that vis-a-vis -vis the a typical frictional response, okay? So at the gross, at the gross level, we can identify where the cohesion is break, broken down. But what happens at the interparticle and scale, we, we don't know really. Because as I told you, the experiment is like a hollow cylinder with pressure internally, externally, whatever torque, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't know what's happening inside, inside that system. So the, the, what I'm going to get at is what happens exactly at the micro scale and how does that sort of manifest itself at the ensemble scale? At the maxima, what's happening at the... Yeah. So this is the macro lens scale. So I will go down to the micro scale, uh, uh, the next part. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. This one? Well, the magnitude of the volumetric string somewhat remains the same. I mean, they're not, they won't collapse on one another. They will not collapse on one another like the way the stresses do. Okay. Oh, why? Oh, because you have this additional material because of the cementation, no? Right? The cementation breaks down, but so you can think about them as feeding in smaller particles into the system. Right? Smaller and smaller particles into the system. So there is a sort of a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that the cementation peels off and falls off as tiny little specks of dust and that goes and fills up the voids. That's not what I'm saying. It's really hard to identify, but the overall ensemble volume response, right? They, they, they don't collapse on one another because obviously the initial densities are slightly different for the two because of our small amounts of cementation that cohesion that we've added you can never create the two of them with the exact same density or the exact same packing fraction. So there is some, some amount of uh, material that is kind of broken down and that remains in the system. Can I, can I ask a clarifying question? That's a cartoon, right? Yeah, 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 it's a cartoon, it's a cartoon. It's not the test, I mean, it's not the result of a real experiment. Well, um, I mean, uh, like I said, it's, it's a, okay, fine. So this part is representing contractivity and this part is representing dilation, okay? So what that means is, so think about the system, you have a bunch of sand grains, okay? Initially when you, or glass beads, sand grains, sugar, anything, just, just about anything, okay? So first, when you apply small amounts of stress, what you will do is to bring the grains together you'll compact the entire ensemble, okay? When you continue to shear, the grains sort of begin to roll over one another and then the overall volume expands, okay? This phenomenon is called dilation, okay? So a classic example of dilation is when you actually walk, walk in the beach, okay? So if you walk, you will see that there's a region around your foot where the the water escapes or it looks like it's dried up. The reason that it looks like it is dried up is because the grains, whenever you have applied a shear force on that system, the grains kind of roll over one another and then the, there is an increase in the void space and the water kind of seeps into the system and it looks like it has dried up around you. And the same idea here too, okay? 
the when you have cohesion between the particles right when you break down the cohesion what you end up having are so if this were my grain and i have a layer of cohesion around it right and i have so this is how all my particles look right this is the glass bead with a surrounding layer of cohesion okay eventually when i break the system down what i end up having are particles that are slightly differently sized than my original glass bead because this is my original glass bead right but eventually when i break the system down i have a bunch of beads that are slightly larger in dimension and the overall system size also is slightly different okay so i don't i can never replicate exactly the volumetric strain curves the stresses however are different you will you will exactly get back the parent sand stress state but the volumetric strain no and this is the state of plastic flow okay at very very large strains i i mean i can get into this a little bit later if there are more clarification okay okay and then again this is some more bookkeeping uh, these are loci of plastic work now um, again if this is little bit complicated for you to understand i'm just trying to represent yield surfaces okay this is a normalized way of representing yield surfaces of uh, if let's say you were looking at steel for example you will have one yield locus because it would not depend on i1 it doesn't matter what the stress state is you will still see a cylinder in stress space so you will essentially see one yield locus whereas here with increasing amounts of stresses you see that the yield surface is increasing in size this is what it looks like in sigma 1 sigma 3 space okay um and by the way i'm just showing you projections of this okay this what a1 r a this is s1 s2 s3 space and i'm projecting it into this in into a 2d space the yield surface in three dimensional space is represented on a 2d surface on a piece of paper and this is what it looks like okay um now i'm also showing you what happens to the plastic flow direction in other words if i if i am applying stresses in this direction in the horizontal or in the vertical plane do i also see deformations in the same direction or are deformations in the uh, in the other direction right so that's that's also of interest to us and that's kind of what i'm presenting here okay these are the plastic flow directions it's again it's a part of the a uh, whole suite of things that you need to identify before you can build a whole constitutive model in plasticity and that's kind of what i'm doing here okay we can get back to this and speak a little bit more in detail but um, again i don't know how much time i should spend on identifying or describing to you what is meant by coaxiality and all that sort of stuff but the basic idea is do stresses and strains in a simple solid you know that they follow the same direction that is if you apply a stress in this particular direction the specimen also deforms in the same direction okay whereas in a granular ensemble as i told you you have rearrangement particle rearrangement so the major uh, principal stress direction is not the same as the major principal strain direction so there is this non coaxiality between the two so we need to identify what that non coaxiality is that's kind of uh, what i'm presenting here okay so um so this is how the yield surface and again plastic potential surface and the yield surface uh, grow in different rates when you look at the entire constitutive model okay it's a single hardening evolution of the failure surface that i'm presenting okay so the the fundamental idea that we that uh, that's sort of well accepted is think about the extra cohesion as some sort of an intercept on the model failure surface okay so now the question that we can ask is how should what does the intercept depend on and when we break down this interparticle cohesion what does it eventually look like okay and uh, that's that's what i have sort of summarized when you look at the overall ensemble level picture of this deformation now let's move on to 
what happens at the microstructure. So you, yeah, this is uh, again pl plasticity, associativity versus non-associativity. So if I have the same plastic potential and the yield surface, If I have the exact same plastic potential as well as the yield surface, the model is called associative. When you don't have coincidence of the two, of the two surfaces, then they are called non-associative. Okay. So now the experiments happen at the micro scale. Okay. You take the exact same specimen, take it to the synchrotron, stick it in front of the beam and then figure out what do the particles look like, okay? And you can also do another experiment where you are loading the beam, I mean, I'm sorry, you are loading the specimen and simultaneously capturing how the, what happens to this inter-particle arrangement as you're loading this specimen. So you can look at the experiments at, at this length scale also. So the idea is, we have looked at everything at the global scale, at the ensemble length scale. So what, let us look at what happens to the interparticle cohesion here. Okay. So what does this require? We, we need, uh, again, a smaller specimen and corresponding uh, uh, changes in the specimen dimension, et cetera, et cetera, and since so the particle dimension also. And we also need to understand how do we map the interparticle cementation and how do we track it in time? Okay, these are some of the things that we need to understand here. Okay, so the, I'm going to present just one experimental data set. Of course, we have tried all sorts of models, all sorts of cementation and all that, but I'm just going to tell you that uh, these are single crystal quartz particles with 2% epoxy. Okay, that's the experiment that I'm going to show you. And so this is the dimension of the specimen. You take this particular specimen and then you take it into the synchrotron and then compress it. And let's see what happens after that, okay? Okay, so obviously with like any- uh, Do you just compress it or do you do the loading as before? Oh, no, 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 no. That is extremely complicated to do. That loading is very, very complicated to do. Yeah, this is very straightforward uniaxial loading. The, the specimen is confined in a tube and then you just load it because the whole uh, in, inside cell pressure, outer cell pressure, to put all that inside a synchrotron is impossible. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a straightforward algorithm of how to identify particles in a CT. Uh, this is just a pipeline of the uh, analy analyzing the CT data set. So you collect all the images from the CT and then you perform a bunch of uh, distance transforms and then Morse mail complex, etc. And then the output will give you individual particles, the connectivity of the particles, the contract regions, and then overall you can look at visualization. The whole the whole works. This is this is the pipeline of exactly what we do when we get images from the CT and play around with the imaging uh, to to get all the necessary microstructural information. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, we use this uh, most theory-based segmentation for our CT data. So the, it's, a, it's actually quite nice. The, instead of using a very straightforward watershed algorithm, we use this MS complex-based algorithms, which I think are, uh, are nicer than the watershed algorithms because especially when you have particles that are non-spherical and that have very complex geometries, to segment that data is really hard. So we need, uh, we need very robust algorithms. So we've, uh, we've finally come to the conclusion that most theory-based algorithms are the best to segment this data. Uh, so this is what the pipeline looks like. So you start with the CT data set. This is, these are the quartz particles, which are bonded by epoxy. And then you binarize that image. And then you do a very straightforward distance transform. And then when you run the MS complex, you'll get these critical points uh, and these critical points show this particular, this representative change in the topology. And then you can, you can again figure out what the maxima in these, uh, in these regions are. And these maxima and the saddle points will eventually help you segment the whole set. So it's, uh, I mean, the, obviously I didn't uh, invent this particular algorithm. It's, it's out there, I just use it. 
So this is what eventually this thing looks like. So you start with the segmented data, I'm sorry, the CT data set, and then you can mark out everything, the distance transform, the critical points, and then play around with the entire data set. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the critical points here are those points where the gradient is equal to zero. I kind of, if the, if this particular gradient, so this, uh, the, the gradient of F, this function is the, uh, is my image field, the grayscale image field of the CT data set, right? So every single voxel in the, in that data set is a value of, a, I mean, it has a certain grayscale value. So I have a grayscale field and I find the gradient. And wherever you have these gradients to be equal to zero, those are critical points. So when you mark those out, right? When you mark those critical points out, the, the region between the two critical points is some topological feature. And then you can extract based on that. It's actually quite clever. It's, uh, it really works nicely. Um, so like I, I'll just point out here that the pairs of critical points represent some sort of a topological feature. And then you have a pair cancellation, you can identify, you remove noise and the pipeline is sort of well established and uh, you can work through it and you'll get, you can start writing very straightforward Python codes and you'll end up getting a very nicely segmented CT data set. And the, these work really well for uh, non-spherical geometries because spherical geometries are much easier to segment. Those work with any watershed algorithm or fairly straightforward. Uh, algorithms, but when you have quartz particles that have all sorts of strange shapes, segmenting them is a bit of a challenge. Okay, so this is, uh, and once you get that, that structure, you can also start getting pore connectivity, pore network also, because the spaces in between the particles are obviously regions of, you know, no attenuation densities. Um, I, I hope I'm clear, right? So you have particles that have a certain X-ray attenuation density when you put them inside a synchrotron. So you'll get a actual grayscale value. When you don't have a material, that is when you have a void, you don't have any attenuation density. So that itself you can map out. The pore network is also mapped out equally well. And of course, I mean, it might not be so important for us, but for people in the petroleum industry and all that, mapping out the pore network is very important. Right? Mapping out exactly how do fluids move inside this ensemble is a very crucial thing. So uh, now you can actually do the whole thing. You can map out, you can segment out the particles, you can map out the pore network, you can do pretty much anything uh, with it. Okay. Then the first thing that we ended up doing was, okay, let's back calculate what was the grain, I mean, particle size distribution that we put in. Can we recreate that particle size distribution from our CT data? Obviously we can. So it works uh, reasonably well and we can. And then you can do other things. You can start mapping out the, the network of particles. Okay. So you can, what I'm showing you here are these uh, dots, these black color, whatever purple color dots are the centers of the particle, centroids of the particles. And these black color lines are the connectivity or the contact points between them. So if these two particles are in contact, there's a black color line joining the two centroids of the particles. Okay. And here, what I show you is what is usually referred to as a coordination number. Coordination number is essentially uh, counting of the next door neighbors. Okay. So the point is obviously at the periphery, the coordination number is low, right? At exactly at the center, the coordination number is high because the center particles have many, many neighbors where while at the periphery, you have very few neighbors. Okay. And then you can do, a, like I said, you can, there is no end to the amount of playing that you can do with the data set. Uh, you can also start looking at, is there a certain orientation of the particles? Okay. So you can start looking at the contacts between the particles and you can ask the question, is there a certain orientation in which these particles are aligned? These contacts are aligned. Okay. Now, uh, the, not just at the particle level. So you can, uh, right, you have one particle uh, and you can count the neighbors and then you can write a dyadic product of the contact normals, I essentially end up getting a tensor, okay? Then you can calculate the eigenvalues of that particular tensor, it's a second order tensor. So you can calculate the eigenvalues of that particular tensor, which, it, which is telling you at the ensemble level, 
is there a certain directionality to the way the particles are arranged? That's, uh, it's, uh, it's a question that you can ask and uh, easily answer. Okay, so now when you plot that as a probability density on a sphere, uh, what we are trying to show you here is, yes, there is a certain directional distribution of the particle orientation. So the, it is, all the particles are oriented in the XY plane, but the contacts are all oriented in the Z plane, okay, in the ensemble. Okay, the contacts of the particles are sort of in this plane, whereas the particles themselves lie like this. Okay. Um, again, this is, I mean, doesn't show up very well here, but uh, you should just take my word for it. Okay, now uh, the, the test that I want to present was yes, in the synchrotron, you, you compress it and then image it. And then you compress it at different stages and you image what happens to the, what happens to the system. Okay, uh, as you can see, you start, uh, sort of you start breaking down the interparticle cementation and you eventually have the collapse of the specimen. Okay, so you can essentially map this through the uh, through your uh, synchrotron experiment. Okay, now again you can also ask what happens to my internal coordination number as I'm. I mean, you know, all the microstructural features. You can ask what happens to the grain size, or you can ask what happens to the porosity of the entire ensemble. What happens to the pore structure? And these uh, T0, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, represent the stages of uh, the test. So the test is not continuous, okay? So you, uh, you compress it, stop, scan, compress it some more, stop, scan, compress it some more, stop, scan. So you can do about four or five or seven or any number of stages that you want in, the, in that particular test. Okay, I have a few more minutes. I'll, uh, I'll quickly glance through this. Okay, now uh, we did a few other things. Uh, I want to show you what is meant by uh, linearity. Okay, so now you can actually track from point to point. Is there a certain uh, directionality to the particle contact? Okay, so we want to ask this question, right? So where do, how does the force propagate through this through the system? So if if in a typical granular ensemble, you know that particles are in contact and forces are propagating through those contacts. So now, again, in my system, the particles are certainly in contact, but what happens is there is a little bit of cohesion between the particles. So now we can ask, okay, what, what does this do? So is there a certain directionality to this propagation of the forces? So one, one way to ask this question is to ask, if you were to draw sort of uh, vectors, the contact vectors between particles, uh, the deviation from this linearity is giving you some measure of how the contacts are propagating. Okay? So think about them as linear chains that are propagating through the, uh, I mean, mathematically linear chains that are propagating through the ensemble. So, uh, so then we can look at the entire segmented ensemble, the entire CT segmented ensemble, and then start with how to, where does, I mean, you know, if you start with the first particle on the top, you can figure out what is the, you know, how does the chain propagate, chain of contact propagate through that, uh, through that entire ensemble. So, I mean, like I said, it's not, nothing special because you already have the segmented data. It's very easy to track these uh, paths, okay? And uh, so what we were able to show is, that there is a certain amount of, that is the force propagate from, from the top to the bottom through these linear paths. But the moment you start breaking down, that linearity significantly breaks down here. Okay. At some point when you have the specimen splitting open or fracturing completely, those obviously there is no path of transmission of forces from the top to the bottom. Is it, is it fracture that you think? Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, yeah. It's there. Okay. So now, uh, again, I'm showing you if you add 
small amounts of epoxy, one, two, three percent, even very, very tiny amounts of epoxy, you see that there is a, this is obviously a rotation of the particles as well as deformation of the particles. So uh, even, the, the point is even very small amounts of cohesion really restricts the mean displacement as well as the mean rotation of the particles, okay? Even very tiny amounts, something as small as 1% or 2% of the overall weight of the system. Uh, and it, that kind of begins to break down only at very, very large levels of strain. Okay. The, that is, you'll recover the, the actual parent particle only when you break down significantly the interparticle cementation. Okay. Now, um, like I said, you can, you can think about this and start plotting the preferential paths or dominating fabric chains in the transmission of forces. Okay. So what we are trying to say here is, if you think about a typical granular ensemble, you have a certain uh, network in which forces are transmitted. Okay. The moment you add some amount of cohesion between this, there is what, what I will try to show you is, you can think about this as a completely entangled network of chains. Okay. So, uh, so if, as I told you, you seed the first particle, you start tracking the contacts, maximally aligned contact from the first particle. Okay? You go from particle to particle and then track it down through the entire ensemble. You do that for all the particles at the top. So you will see that you will have a bunch of entangled network of chains that look like this. Okay? And these, by the way, are points joining the maximally aligned contact. So the, 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 the basic assumption that I'm making is if there are two particles in contact, the one that is maximally aligned is the one in which forces are propagating. Okay. Now you can think about them as a bunch of entangled chains. Okay. So the next thing that we did was, okay, let's see if this works physically. Right. So, uh, I'm sorry about this. Um, this movie, but anyway, the, the idea is let's take a bunch of grains, right? And pull this up, just straightforward reports. But let's assume that you start making chains out of these grains, you know, like chains, chains that we all wear, right? A bunch of beads that are joined together by chains, okay? You do the exact same thing. Once the chains get longer and longer, that is n is equal to 24 represents how many beads are there in one chain. So if you go from zero, um, let me, yeah. so if you go from, okay, so observe this, this is zero, this is purely particles. Then you have a system in which you have 24 particles forming a chain and this system in which you have 48 particles forming a chain. So if you move from this system to this system, what you end up seeing is are really stable columns without doing much. All you are doing is that you have a bunch of entangled chains where, whereas here you don't have any interparticle cohesion. Okay. So this itself is, I mean, essentially the point I'm trying to make is you can think about a small amounts of cohesion as doing exactly this. Okay, adding that extra level of entanglement to the system and overall increasing the stiffness of the system. Yeah, so uh, what is the initial condition when you are dropping these chains? So like what's the initial configuration? Uh, the configuration is you just take a cylinder mm. and then, you know, on, on the extreme left here, I have just single steel beads, right. okay? Here, I have beads that are about 24 beads joined together with the chain. Okay, here you have 48 beads joined together with the chain. You just pour the chains into the system and pull the cylinder up. So this is a straightforward repose experiment. So I think my question is that, uh, so when the chains were inside the column, right. the configuration in which they were initially were, is the final structure that you see a function of the initial configuration? No, they're not. That's the thing. Like you just randomize various configurations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just, uh, you I mean, you, you could do the experiment in many ways, right? So you could actually drop them one after another into the original cylinder. So, I mean, you could take a funnel and drop, you know, if you find a really uh, grad student who would like to do this, you can do it. You can make him drop chain after chain after chain and make him sit there for years on end. But 
I mean, no, you, you know, take a bunch of chains and put them into the cylinder and try to randomize the process as much as possible. And but you does, can, uh, yeah, go ahead. How does this depend on the rate at which you are removing the cylinder? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. So that's why this is a very standard experiment in identifying properties of granular media, right? So it really doesn't matter what is the rate at which you remove it. No, you, I'm saying, yeah, you, uh, you can do this, do the experiment in many ways, right? You could actually uh, put the chains in a certain order, right? I mean, you could stack the chains as vertically as possible. I mean, it's not possible for you to do that because obviously there is a certain level of, uh, you know, there's a minimum potential energy configuration. The moment you drop something vertically, it's going to fall into that cylinder in a certain way, right? So you can't really, I don't know how you would do it. You, you can't really sort of uh, push them in a, through a slot. Yeah. I understand the physical constraint, but I'm asking like, do un un unentangled chains become entangled or are they previously entangled itself and the entanglement remains? Even, even though you remove the thing. What's the physical state? Uh, the, yeah, uh, I would say that even if you have a completely un unentangled system, these are not originally entangled. So you, you, you can drop chain after chain. So that experiment is also done, okay? You take the cylinder, you can drop chain after chain. It doesn't really matter. The moment you pull that out, right? You wait for the system to stabilize, pull that out. You end up with that system. Go ahead, please. So in this experiment, you start with Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, so sure. So um, you could, in uh, theory, think about it this way, right? So you could think about the smaller chains representing lesser and lesser amount of cohesion between the particles, right? The slightly higher amount of cohesion represents a far more entangled structure, okay? So uh, uh, this process, the, the one that you were pointing out exactly, is this, uh, there is a certain amount of column formation. So this is a stable column, right? So if you just analyze the stability of the column itself, Right, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward exercise to do. You can think about this as an elastic column and ask the question, what is the minimum height up to which this column would remain stable? And the, way, and the loads on the column are fairly apparent. Okay, it's just the self-weight of the column because I'm really not, not putting anything on top of it. So it's just the self-weight of the column. So with that constraint in mind, you can ask, what will be the minimum height for a stable column? Or, I'm sorry, maximum height of a stable column. Okay, so... We, we've done that exercise. And so the, the answer is, if let's say you have a shorter chain, okay, you have this process of formation of a stable column, an avalanche that forms, again, another column on top of it, uh, an avalanche that forms. And so that's how that heap is formed when you have shorter chain lengths. Okay? Uh, so we have done it for, uh, this is the zero particle uh, zero, uh, or uh, one, n is equal to one, right? So, and this is n is equal to, 24 or something like that. But we've done it for four. So essentially you can think about them as sort of uh, a flexible uh, long particle. A particle that has a slightly different aspect ratio, which is a sort of a flexible long particle. So this kind of a thing has been investigated fairly extensively in granular media. This is called as geometric cohesion, right? The idea is let's say you take a bunch of stapler pins or whatever and then sort of throw them together. You won't form a heap like a normal uh, pile of steel beads would, right? There is a certain uh, a structure that is formed, right? Just because of the fact that you have this geometric inter, uh, I mean, the tangling, uh, yeah, entanglement of the particles. And that's kind of what I'm saying. So if you have, the, the analogy that I'm trying to make here is, if you have small amount of cohesion between the particles, you can think about the cohesion as, adding some sort of an extra amount of entanglement to the system, thereby providing stability to the system. Okay, when you start breaking down this cohesion, right, you go back to the original system, original non-cohered system, okay? So there is one instance that I want to show you, is that of a termite mark. 
So the so I did some uh, little bit of work where we asked the question, what is the reason for the stability of these termite mounds? Okay, why do they remain stable over long periods of time? And what is the cause of this particular strength? So um, I, I didn't put a movie of the termites putting this thing together, but the answer is essentially this. Okay? The termites kind of bring the soil particles together and the interparticle suction between the soil right, acts as that extra chain acts as that extra cohesion that provides that overall stability to the system. Right? That's what cohesion uh, will do to your system. And eventually you can think about them as a bunch of entangled uh, granular chains but, or soil chains that are held together by some sort of a suction. Okay, the, the link between the particles is, or the whatever I added as epoxy, in fact, comes about naturally because of the suction. Um, do I have uh, time to show you just one more? Yeah, and these are my final remarks. I am uh, I have my thank you slide, but I want to show you one more last thing because he said I have time. Okay. So now you can also ask, what does this uh, scaling do, right? So if let's say you do an experiment where you have the same size specimens but with different size particles. So, or yeah, as you can see, larger grains here, much finer grains here. Okay. So this has a very interesting uh, uh, manifestation. Okay. Unlike uh, a very straightforward fracture problem, the the idea of a fracture problem is that if you have larger and larger glass panels, for example, it's much easier to break them apart. The reason is you have a single flaw in the system. And it's very easy to propagate the fracture from flaw to flaw because the probability of finding a flaw in a large piece of glass is much higher. Okay, so that's well, it's it's a very well known scaling phenomena. So much larger specimens have much lower strength. Okay, whereas here the opposite works because of the fact that you have uh, many many particles and essentially have a bunch of entangled chains. The system works in an opposite way. That is the larger the specimen, the more stable the specimen is, okay? And we think that that might be one of the reasons why you have very large hills, mountains, et cetera, that remain stable over very long periods of time because the larger it is somehow the stabler it looks. Okay? It's a, it's a interesting manifestation that we are working on right now. Uh, and yeah, of course we did all these uh, interesting sets of experiments where uh, if let's say you control the same number of particles, right? That is in other words, you, you have the same number of chains, so to speak, or the same length of the chains, you end up getting the same strength. Okay. So you, we, we can do a bunch of tests, right? Where you have the same specimen size, but different size particles or different sizes of specimens, or you have the exact same number of particles throughout the entire system. So when you play around with all this, you still end up getting this additional length scale into the system that is above and beyond the regular continuum length scale. So what I mentioned to you in the beginning of the talk, where I said that, okay, let's think about 10 particles as somewhat representing a continuum length scale. The moment you have cohesion between the particles, there is an additional length scale that plays into the system. Okay. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of what is shown here. So if you have longer and longer particles, you have much stiffer and stiffer response. Okay. And, uh, yeah, this is the last one. Okay, I don't want to get greedy here. But yeah, so uh, think about all these particles in which the force chains are propagating, right? The moment you have some sort of a cohesive inclusion in the particle, the, the force chains kind of are, I mean, these inclusions, this cohesion between the particles act like a sink where all the force chains are drawn towards that particular inclusion. And that's what, that's the reason it gives it that extra stability. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. I'm sorry if my question is not very well phrased, but um, so here you have these force lines that form at the point of fracture. Uh, I mean, interestingly, the reverse is what happens in soft solids, right? When you have jamming. 
Yeah. Uh, so is it that these are sort of, uh, is there a mapping between these phenomena or are they uh, complementary in some way? No, good question. Because see, uh, the so this idea, right? I mean, you can essentially the one of the responses or one one of the ways that we could explain this is think thinking about them as polymers. Right? So far more entangled polymers are much much stronger than you know bunch of less entangled polymers. So that's the, that's a similar type of an analogy that I'm trying to draw. Right? Uh, uh, I mean, besides that, I, I don't know how else, I really have to think about it as to how do I draw parallels between this to a, something with an inclusion, let's say a soft solid with an inclusion in it. Right? So those are some things that I- It seems like jamming and fracture have some similarities in that, which is interesting. Yeah. the. I mean, it's not too difficult to think about it that way because, um, so if you were to think of a jammed system, uh, it's essentially all the particles in contact. A jammed system is essentially particles in contact. That is describing or uh, behaving as a standard solid, right? I mean, the ensemble response is that of a solid, right? I mean, that's how you're able to draw those jamming phase diagrams, right? So you have, a, if you look at the very standard whatever Mike Kate's kind of a uh, phase diagram, you have packing fraction on one axis and I think uh, stress on the other axis, right? So there is this, this threshold packing fraction right, above which the system behaves like a fluid, below which it behaves like a solid. And that's the, the same scenario. And, uh, the, and, and the, the, the whole thing about fracture is, uh, one step above that, right? You start with a solid system, and fracture happens when you when you are when you have stressed the system enough that you'll break them apart. So you, they are no longer in contact. So, I mean, I I haven't thought about how to fuse the two phase diagrams, but yeah. Hi, yeah, so um, nice talk. So here in these slides from the left to the right, the left one will have the densest, uh, will be the densest state, right? And the right one should have a lower density. Uh, no, you can actually control the density also. You can control them to start, I mean, well, let me put it this way. The starting of the experiment, you can control them to have the same density, the same packing. The same packing. You can control. Them. Right, I see. So then whatever density you give, does that remain throughout? No. No. I mean, right. See, whatever it reposes, it reposes right. to that. Right. So if you like control the mass instead of the density. Yeah, these were all controlled mass. Yeah. yeah. So the right one um, should have the lowest density or is there in trend with the of the density from left to right or? Uh, um, I mean, you could potentially calculate it, but what I'm saying here is these are, these are the equilibrium configurations, right? Right. Yes. So it is. I mean, the repose density is what the repose density is. Yes. Um, so I, I was asking actually in the line of like, what would be the uh, limit uh, of the length scale where you would see such, where you would stop seeing such uh, phenomena, like in the lower limit, like this is in a macroscopic scale, right? So what would be the lower bound uh, uh, of where you might not see this phenomenon anymore? Um, Any idea on that? Can you refer um, to your question? So like this, say this is, uh, can you tell me the length scale once again of this, uh, like of each individual chain? Sure. Uh, like, is it in micrometers uh, uh, or, or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, the particles are like. One, right, yeah. Something like that. So 60 nanometers is, is that? 60, 60 millimeters. millimeters right? yeah. So I'm asking like, what could be the minimum length scale where you might see this? Um, like, will it be in micrometers or can you go even lower than that is what I'm trying to ask actually. Uh, okay, well, uh, the biggest uh, sort of disclaimer here is every single experiment that I've presented here is all at the macro lens scale. So there is no nano lens uh, scale here at all. Okay. So even inside the synchrotron, the specimens are bulky. They're about mm -hmm. two millimeter in diameter and about four millimeter in height. Uh, I see, okay. Okay, so there's nothing that is at the at the smaller lens scale. So the particles are all 
definitely greater than 500 microns. Right, so everything is a bulky particle. There, there's no thermal fluctuation. There is nothing that you have to be worried about and at that mm -hmm. uh, length. Okay, okay, okay. I see. Thank all, you. all are bulky. Right. Every particle is bulky. Uh, does the, sorry, the maximum height of this tower scale uh, proportionally to the size of the particle? Yeah, yeah. We expect that it should. We definitely expect that it should. Uh, well, one more question. So if you have a mixture of these two, like small chain and some large chain. Yeah, yeah, he's working on it. Yeah, I'll tell you in the answer in a little bit of time. Have, okay. Go ahead, please. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. So um, when we have different uh, a number of say particles and we know the number of constraint between those particles and the connectivities mm -hmm. we can use say maxwell counting to uh, to comment on the rigidity of the system yeah and here you are taking a different approach where you consider the percolation of force percolation of the force chains and uh, um, is there a relation like good point so um, what i want to say there is uh, I am not commenting about the force percolation. Okay, these are purely contact percolation. It's very very hard to map out forces between particles. So the experiment, the second experiment that we are that we are doing that I didn't show here, is you can actually do a combination of tomography as well as XRD, X-ray diffraction. Okay, by looking at how the XRD evolves in time, you can back calculate from the diffraction patterns, what is the strain at each grain uh, or it, at each particle, and then compute what the contact forces. You can easily do that. I mean, it, not easily do that, but you can do that. Okay, So that's, we, we are getting there. So the idea is, then we will have a map of the network of forces and the network of contacts, and we can, we can see whether these are completely coaxial. Do they lie on top of each other? But yes. The Cremona four styles, that sort of counting configuration and all that, that actually maybe Bulbul Chakravarti would have done, right? So those sorts of things are purely on force maps. So the experiment that I was showing you on that uh, photoelastic disks, th that's where they would have done that kind of, uh, that kind of a mapping. The, I mean, on the force maps, it works perfectly. But on the contact maps, we don't know whether they are, they, you can really uh, lay them on top of one another. We don't know that yet. I think continuing on that, the Maxwell criteria probably works when the forces are non-frictional. Yeah, 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 certainly. So yeah, these, these are things which forces. have a huge friction. No, again, see, the, the point is it's, uh, don't worry about the origin of the forces. So just think about them as a network of forces that are percolating from one end of the specimen through the other, right? Just look at them as a network of forces and ask the question, would the network of forces lie on top of the network of contacts? Are they purely coaxial? If yes, then let's not let's do away with the forces uh, measurement of the forces itself. Let's because it's far easier for us to determine kinematics of the system than kinetics of the system, right? It's very easy for us to determine rotations, displacements, uh, pore network, and the, the and the whole works. But whenever you're thinking about computing forces in the system, those become very hard to do. Yeah, whether are they frictional, are they purely contact, and whether the you know does it change from a contact force to a frictional force, et cetera? I mean, those are much harder questions to answer and uh, uh, even play around in the experimental setup. Uh, separate question. So I, I, I read long back that if you have these granular mounds, mm -hmm. the scaling of the pressure is not like the hydrostatic pressure that you would get in, say, a normal liquid. No, no. What about these entangled things? Uh, yeah, so uh, actually, uh, great question. So if, let's say, you have... Um, Let's say you have a typical heap, right? If let's say you have a granular heap like this, right? There are two schools of thought. So if let's say you plot the, the forces at the center, right? You obviously don't have, what you end up having is like a sort of a dip in the force system. So if this were the scaled force, right? So you have a slight dip in the system when you have this distribution of the forces at exactly at the center. And now let's let's assume that you have you're talking about a cylinder with a bunch of grains, and you plot uh, 
stress inside this system as a function of z, as a function of depth. So for fluids, obviously it's rho gh, but for a granular system, it looks something like this, slightly different. Okay. So there, in that uh, in that stable column type of thing, what we end up seeing is for, for a heap, it looks like this, right? For a column, it looks like somewhat like this. So as you go, I mean, the, the whole thing seems to be very stable. So at different cross sections, you have pretty much the same stress. Okay. Um, so uh, let's thank uh, Tejas for a wonderful talk. <laughs>